Um, I'm sure that Neville will post the presentation as well as the, uh, you know, the video of this. Um, and you might want to look at some of these slides even more in depth, because I'll go through them, but in the interest of time, I have to go through kind of quickly. And some of them are just cool. There's a lot of information in there. And so we were talking earlier about um, my experience with uh, renewable energy. <clears throat> I've seen it as a, a, a vehicle for economic um, growth for jobs. Um, I, you know, I like the environment as well, and um, I've just seen it change people's lives because at Construction Tech, I've seen people get into solar uh, in California, and they have good work and a bright future. Um, I also have lived here for a really long time, so when I was a kid, we used to go down to San Bernardino to do any kind of major shopping. So before school started and at Christmas. We would go down the Inland Center Mall or Central City Mall in San Bernardino. And in the 70s, the pollution was unbelievable. We would literally be sitting in the parking lot of the mall, and you couldn't see the mall. You could see the gray, dark gray outline of a mall, right? And you might see a illuminated kind of light of Sears or something like that, but you could not see the mall. And that's because of all the pollution that was in the air. And so um, for those that are not satisfied with the air quality, good, don't be. We need to get it back to what it was like in 1940. But I can tell you that we have made huge strides. And so um, solar, electric cars, higher miles per gallon for the cars that we have, um, wind, renewable energy, those are the things that are going to make our lives um, much, much better. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, the good news is that I'm very optimistic. Um, I read a lot of things. I'm extremely uh, optimistic about where we're going. And so um, I want to share that with you and just, like I say, talk about different things. So the first thing is we might look at what the different types of renewable energies are. And so we got photovoltaics, solar thermal, wind, hydro, biomass, and, well, Fossil fuels. Although fossil fuels aren't renewable, they're part of our energy uh, uh, mix that we get things from. And when you look at it, at first it's kind of depressing. 80% of the world's energy use comes from fossil fuels. And only 20% comes from uh, what we call renewable. Um, that's not good. But the good news is, is we are moving in the right direction now. Um, so other energy sources, they're not from the sun's energy, but uh, they're also a part of the mix, and that would include nuclear, geothermal, and tidal. So when we say things are from the sun's energy, here's a question. How are these things from the sun's uh, energy? How is photovoltaic from the sun? Yes, it's an interactive situation here. <laughs> photovoltaic are the panels that are on top of a... Of a you know, a house, the sun hits it, and it turns directly into uh, electricity. So you're taking sun's energy, light, turns it to, to uh, electricity. Pretty sweet, pretty straightforward. But think about like wind, for example. How is wind coming from the sun? Um, the, the pressure it creates, it creates a uh, pressure system. Yeah. It pulls uh, air into uh, like a uh, hot to cold. Yeah, so as, as the Earth's spinning around and, the, you know, the Earth's tilted and all that, we have cold areas, we have higher elevations, lower elevations. And so there's, depending on where you're at, the, the sun is heating the air and it's creating pressure differences. And that creates air moving from high pressure to low pressure. And as it does that, that's called wind. Um, hydroelectric. Now, how does hydroelectric come from the sun? How does that work? Maybe, um, yeah, in the back. Uh, it doesn't come from the sun? What, the hydroelectric does come from the sun indirectly, but how? Hydro is running water through a turbine, right? But how is the sun involved in that? It gets hot. What gets hot? The, the water. The water in the ocean or a lake, it evaporates, right? What causes it to evaporate? Sunlight. And it goes up, it goes over, and then it comes down, right? either in snow or rain, and then it's at a higher elevation. It's up in a mountain somewhere. And as it runs downhill, we run it through a turbine, and we force it to make electricity for us. Hey, you, give us electricity, right? 
So as you walk through it, you're like, wow, the sun produces most of our energy. What about fossil fuels? How are fossil fuels coming from the sun? How does oil come from the sun? How does coal come from the sun? Well, it's organic, uh, decomposed organics that are in the geo, whatever, in the bottom, and it gets, um, turns to oil over time. So orig organic, that one. originally that, that coal or that oil or that natural gas, it was a living organism and it relied on photosynthesis, right? So in other words, there's all these plants turning the sun light into uh, hydrocarbon chains and then they died and then it be, you know, got compressed and all that stuff for a hundred million years. But, I, but basically when you look at fossil fuels, all fossil fuels are is compressed sun. It's just stored sunlight energy. Um, from eons ago. So the sun's pretty important. When we look at nuclear geothermal uh, and tidal, those are actually things that are not from the sun. Nuclear is caused by the, the decomposition of radioactive material, and as it decomposes, it heats things up. Um, geothermal is caused by the Earth's core being really hot, and um, so we're able to take advantage of that. And then what's tidal caused for? What causes the tides? The moon, right? Everyone's watched Avatar, right? With Aang? Yeah, waterbenders. So we all know the full moon is pretty powerful stuff. So the, as, the, as the moon goes around, it pulls the water with it. And so it raises the, the water and lowers it. And again, we could take advantage of that and use it to produce electrical energy. Is that an actual picture or just a um, representation of what they hope to do in the future? Um... They actually have something that's very similar like this in the Hudson Bay off of New York. Um, and and, and I, I promise there will be a part where we go through these things fairly quickly, but we will hit all of these, these items in this beginning. So this is kind of an intro to get your, your brain going a little bit. So we're talking about sustainable energy <coughs> or renewable energy. And when we talk about that, we want to look at something that is not substantially depleted by continued use. So what happens is, is we want an energy source that we're going to use and we're going to be able to use 100 years from now and 1,000 years from now, right? And it not cause problems. Because as the, we use it and it's gone, it becomes more and more precious, right? And then what happens when something's precious and there's only a certain amount of it? It becomes really expensive. And then what's the other bad thing? War. We fight wars over this stuff, guys. So we want to get away from that. Uh, pollution, environmental problems. We, we want to get away from that as well. And health hazards and social injustices. We want to get away from that now. And so when we look at, at all those different sources of energy for our society, which ones could be sustainable? Please. Probably these photovoltaic solar ones, wind, mm -hmm. hydro, right? Mm -hmm. Bioenergy. What about coal? Mm -hmm. Why is coal not a good uh, candidate? It, yeah, I mean, like slowly, 100 million years slowly, right? And it, and it also releases greenhouse gases, which heats up our earth. And it also puts, there's sulfur in it. There's all a bunch of nasties in there. Uh, same thing with oil, gas, and, natu and natural gas. They're, those are all ones that we use it, it's gone, and it also changes our atmosphere, and that's a problem. Uh, nuclear, where, where, is nuclear uh, sustainable? There's some good and bad, and that one's a little, yeah, right? Because waste, nuclear, the problem with nuclear is when you get done, you have radioactive rods that are spent, but they're still dangerous. And then all the water that was circulating, that's all radioactive. And so that becomes an issue. So that would not, uh, you know, it does entail significant pollution, so that's a problem. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff because it doesn't produce CO2. Um, and then... What about tidal wave and geothermal? Those are ones that could be. So um, when we talk about could be, keep in mind that every time we do something, we could do it wisely, and we could do it really dumbly. <laughs> and so we, we do a mix. I mean, you know, all these things can be done in a way that harms things. So you do a tidal uh, plant, but you do it on the Great Barrier Reef. Probably not a good idea, right? All right. So we, we got to be wise about it. Um, so photovoltaic, we're going to start walking through these different uh, energy sources. Photovoltaic, photo means light, voltaic means electricity, so we're turning a uh, light into electricity. 
<coughs> um, that electricity that comes off of it is going to be called direct current, which is different than alternating current. So one of the things that happens is we're going to have to convert it into uh, alternating current. And the reason why we have to do alternating current is almost everything we have was designed for alternating current. What's funny is your cell phone, your laptop computer, it uses direct current. But what we do is you plug it into alternating current and you have to convert it into direct current. So we're converting back and forth all the time. But with um, voltaic, it's going to be direct current. And so one of the things that we can do is put it into a battery because batteries are direct current. And so it easily charges a battery. Um, all right. Solar thermal. Solar, right, coming from the sun, and thermal. What's thermal mean? Water is one of the things that we heat, but the thermal is that heat part, right? So when we say solar thermal, we're talking about we're going to heat something. And usually it's water, but sometimes it can be oil, and they even have this salts. They have this, this one technology where they, they, they take these special salts, and they heat them up so much that they turn into a liquid. And they're able to store a crazy amount of, of energy by doing that. And so that ends up being a kind of a new way of, of doing solar thermal. But again, we're going to take sunlight, turn it into heat, and then we're going to do something with it. So sometimes we're going to take a shower with it, right? So you could have a solar thermal system on your roof at your house. It heats up water. It puts it into a, a, a tank, just like your, water, uh, your gas water heater does. And then you take a shower, and the hot water comes out of the shower head, and you take a shower. So you can do that. <coughs> you can make soup with it. So if you're a Campbell's, or Progresso or whatever, what do you do every day? You, you clock in at the, at the big factory, right? And you make soup. And what do you need for soup? You need hot water. So you could either heat that water with natural gas, or you could heat it with an awesome solar thermal uh, system up on your roof. And so what we're finding is an, uh, the, the, there's an industrial use of solar thermal is happening. And businesses are finding that on a, a large scale, solar thermal works just for heating up the water. But what we're going to talk about mostly is these utility scale, meaning big scale solar thermal plants, and they make electricity. Okay, so um, there's different technologies out there, and we'll talk about each one. Tony, with those three liquids, is there one that works better than another, more efficient? Um, yes. Uh, again, depending on your, you know, at your house, if you just want hot water, then water is going to be awesome. But if you are doing it at a utility scale, you want something that doesn't corrode, but water kind of corrodes. If it gets just a little bit of impurity in there, it'll start corroding things. If it's pure, it actually doesn't. Um, so that's why they'll do oil. But then, like I say, this um, salt, because the temperatures are higher, there's a law of thermodynamics that says that the, the greater the difference between uh, this in the system, the greater the force and the efficiency of the system. And so we'll get into that. I'm actually going to show you um, different technologies that are actually out there right now with the solar thermal. Um, another source is wind. Wind, renewable, right? Uh, it's going to spin a turbine. And so what happens is, you know, you've got these blades, it spins, it makes what's called wild AC. Wild because it spins at different speeds depending on the speed of the wind. Right? And so the rotation kind of, you know, when we look at electricity, we look at like voltage, we look at the hertz, which is the periods per second. And so wind creates kind of a crazy AC, and so what we have to do is convert it into AC that we can use. So a lot of times it'll charge a battery, and then from the battery, just like we did in solar, it'll uh, be inverted and turned into uh, usable AC. Okay. Oh, great. Welcome, Lewis Center. We're just getting started. Uh, we're I probably have like my sixth or seventh slide. Okay. All right. Um, hydroelectricity. What's hydro? Water. And what we're going to do is just like we had when we had wind, right? We had wind pushing a blade that spun a shaft that turned a generator that created electricity. Water's going to do the same thing. We're going to use water instead of wind. Now, water is more dense than wind. 
And so hydro is a much more powerful way to make electricity. And what they do, even though you see that, you always see that with these dams, right? That's not creating electricity. It's just letting some water out because there's a lot of water in the lake. This actually happens underwater. They have an in, input called a penstock, and then it goes through the turbine, and then from there it goes to a downstream outlet. So it actually usually lets it out underneath. But this is to entertain you, right? To be like, wow, look at that dam. That's awesome. Um, but anyways, hydro used to be the number one source of electricity. And uh, here in the Inland Empire, we had the first um, hydro uh, plant in the United States. And it's over in San Bernardino somewhere. It's off of some stream. And they were using it to, make, to power pumps to pump water to Redlands to grow oranges. So um, that was like in 1890-ish. So kind of cool. Um, that hydro was one of the first ways of making electricity. And then from there, um, we've increased the hydro all the time. But at this point, most of it's played out. And the growth is so big that hydro, as a percentage of the whole thing, has gotten smaller, um, even though it's cranking out more um, electricity every year. And then bioenergy. Um, bioenergy, there is a lot of ways to do bio. Essentially, what we're going to do is, remember we talked about plants capturing sun's energy, right? And they're going to make these chains of uh, hydrocarbons. And what we do when we, we break them, it releases energy. So anybody who's been at a campfire, what happens when you put a log on the fire? It burns. And you get heat, you get light, you get smoke, and you get ash, right? And so if we can pull off that heat, we can do something with it. That's the energy that's in there and the light that's in there. And so with bio, uh, that's one of the ways we can do it. We can burn it. Does anyone know any other ways that we can um, use bioenergy? What's that? Reusing the same thing in what way? H have you guys been out to the wastewater plant yet? Or heard about it? We literally have a wastewater plant that takes your turds, right? Flush the toilet. And it goes to this place and they take what they call the solids, right? Um, and they put it into a big tank and they have all these microbes and they eat it. And as they eat it, they release methane gas. And then they pump the methane gas to another area and they use it kind of like you would natural gas to heat up and create um, uh, electricity. Uh, so pretty interesting. Um, that's another way of doing bio. So you could burn it. You could process it somehow and create gases. Uh, Neville talked a little bit yesterday about algae. And there's a promise of, hey, if we take algae and we kind of feed it with something and it produces an oil, then maybe we can extract the oil from the algae and then put it in a bottle and, and that could be a liquid fuel for us. And then you guys know about ethanol. Ethanol is a way of taking uh, corn and sugar and turning it into like a gasoline equivalent uh, liquid fuel. So there's a lot of different things going on with bioenergy. Um, that you can look at. And they're all really interesting. Right now, ethanol is probably the biggest thing that we're doing with it. And then stuff like these smaller plants where we take sewage and make it into usable electricity, which is pretty smart. Coal. Coal is a number one source of electricity in the world, sadly. Um, it's about 40% of uh, electricity is made from coal. And so, um, the problem with coal is it produces a lot of carbon dioxide and other uh, uh, pollutants. And so, uh, big problem. Um, now, what's the good news? About two months ago, England, for one day, did not use coal to generate electricity. It was the first time since like the 1850s that they went a day without using uh, uh, coal. And what replaced? all that electricity generation, wind, and some solar, and some other things. But they're, they really have gone big into wind in, in Britain. 
So it's some pretty cool stuff going on in the world. Uh, like I say, a lot of people look at the world and they say, man, we had three hurricanes, you know, simultaneously more or less in the Caribbean and all this stuff. And yes, that's true. But I look at some of the positives as the directions that we're going. Yes, sir. Um, I heard um, they banned, um, I guess, gasoline oh, combustion engines in Europe. And I guess um, all car companies have been pressured to make affordable electric vehicles. Yeah, so a lot of the, co the countries in Europe are saying in 2030 or 2035 that you won't be able to sell um, an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, because we have the technology now to make the car, it's just a matter of making a lot of them, and the efficiency will drive down the cost, just like I've seen in solar. Um, again, you know, like I told you guys, I'm pretty savvy on it. I've watched solar prices drop about 65% in five years. So something that used to cost $10,000 now costs $3,500. Um, when I was in my 20s, they came out with this thing called a DVD player. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. <laughs> all right, well, the first one came out, it was about 1000 bucks, And all the really nerdy, really into music people, they went out and bought them. That's a little bit too much for me. And then the next year, they were like 300 bucks. Then the year after that, it was, they made them for little kids for Christmas presents. SpongeBob SquarePants DVD player. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, so I've seen what happens when industry gets into something and like works it and gets competitive and they're, com they're trying to sell. And, the, and what happens is the, the price drops and the quality goes up and the features go up. And it's so no difference with electric cars. It's just a matter of getting off your buns and saying, We've been doing this for 40, 100 years, depending on your, the length of your, your, your company, and now we have to change. Um, so it's good stuff. Uh, so again, uh, coal is, is kind of the, the, the really bad one out there, and really the attention is on reducing coal usage um, and, and replacing it with other types of um, energy. And, and so of course, renewable energy is, is our best option. Uh, oil and gasoline and diesel. Um, these are uh, very important parts of our energy mix. So when we talk about energy, they are probably about 40%, somewhere in that way. Well, probably about 30, 35%, I, I should say, of the energy that we use is, for, uh, is via oil, gas, and diesel. And what do we tend to put those things into? Into cars, right? And what other things do we put it into besides cars? Generators, so we do have diesel generators, um, <clears throat> and what else? Trucks, trucking, motorcycles. Lawnmowers. Lawnmowers, yeah, that's true. Um, what's that? Yeah, you could, a power washer. Um, what about airplanes? Yeah, and space shuttle. Well, not space shuttle, but we don't have a space shuttle anymore. But, but for, for the most part, when you want to go fast and for a long time, you're going to want this because it's very dense, the energy in there. And it's portable. And so it's pretty cool stuff. It's hard to replace. Again, when you start looking at where we're at now as a society technologically, what are we replacing that with? The, the function of gasoline or diesel, what are we replacing it with? Electrical battery. So we're able to do the same thing. We're able to store energy in something and make it portable. You put it in your car and you drive to Vegas with it and it, it releases energy and then it's renewable because we can charge that thing up and we can use it over and over again. So um, for a long time, transportation and electricity were very separate, never really crossed over kind of things and now they're, um, they're intermingling. So it's kind of interesting what's going on with, with um, oil, gas and diesel. And then natural gas, whoop, natural gas. Uh, it's much better than coal, and so right now uh, we're switching a lot of our coal plants over to natural gas plants. Um, we use it not only to make electricity, but we use it to heat our homes. Um, natural gas is the number one way to uh, heat your home. We also use natural gas for um, industry. They use it for, to make, believe it or not, plastics, uh, and, and they'll use petroleum as well. And then nuclear, uh, there's two types of nuclear. One is called fission, the other one's fusion. Fission is when we split an atom and create all that radioactivity. 
but we also get a ton of heat and energy off of it. And then we capture it in, in water. The water gets hot, we circulate the water, and then we take that heat and turn it into steam, and then we take that steam and turn it into electricity. Um, nuclear power plants are amazing things. They, they create like two megawatts uh, of power, typically. Could be more, sometimes some of them are like, a, a whole complex of them might be eight megawatts, which is a crazy amount. And the cool thing about them is they run 24 hours a day, and they just super stable, awesome way to make electricity. Bad thing is radiation, um, accidents. You can have meltdowns. We've had a few um, over the over the decades. Um, so uh, fusion would be awesome, and that's when we were able to put atoms together. So the sun does that. You remember we were talking about all this energy we have, and really we got it from the sun. Well, how, where did the sun get the energy? Well, it got it from fusion. So in, the sun is turning itself from a hydrogen into a, uh, a helium uh, star. And as it does that, it releases all this energy. And that's what makes life on Earth possible. Um, again, one of those complicated, if you're, you know, for time purposes, we won't go through all this. But this is kind of how nuclear works. And it kind of walks you through how um, the water flows. One thing to know about nuclear is that um, it has a closed loop system, meaning the same radioactive water, it recirculates over and over and over again. And then other water is heated by the radioactive water. They never touch. So when you see something like that, that might alarm you. If you go, well, it's a nuclear power plant and it's shooting out all that steam, that steam is clean. It is not radioactive. All right. Um, tidal. Again, as we look through this, um, you look at the, the low tide, the high tide. Um, as this happens, the water level, the ocean goes up or down. And then we can use that um, as the water transitions, it has to flow. And if we put a turbine in front of it, just like we did wind, just like we did hydro, it'll spin the turbine and make um, electricity for you. So. Um, this is what it might look like. Um, so these, this is operating one. I want to say this one's in France. And what happens is as the tide goes up, it captures it. And then when the tide goes down, the water level drops. And then as the water goes through, um, it, uh, it creates electricity. Another way of doing it is in a, in a straight, like in a narrow channel. You can put turbines, just like windmills. And they have a project like this in, um, in New York where, they, um, where the water rolls through. And then what's cool is the water will go this way for a while. And then another part of the day, it'll go that way. And that thing will rotate. And it's always making electricity with the, with the flow of the water. There are periods of time where the water is um, slack. It's not moving. And so um, that, that causes a little bit of a problem. Or not a problem, but just it, it's intermittent. It's not going to produce uh, 24 hours a day. And then wave energy. Wave energy is pretty interesting because it, it goes up and down. And as it goes up and down, there's different technologies to kind of capture that energy and turn it into electricity. Geothermal is um, an energy where we take advantage of the fact that in the center of the Earth, it's really, really hot. And um, it gets down to, it gets up to about 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's way down there. But as you transition up through the Earth, it gets cooler and cooler. But there's some places where the lava kind of comes up or the heat comes up and we're able to, you know, it's only down there a couple hundred feet or something like that. And what we can do is, dry, is, is, is put a pipe in the ground put water, force it down in there, and then somewhere else have a pipe coming up. As that water comes up, it's now really hot, it's steamy, and we can make it uh, spin a, a turbine. So that's how ge geothermal works. Um, I've got some videos. Again, for time purposes, um, we're going to uh, not necessarily look at those, but uh, they're, they're there for you to look at if you want to. And. I'm going to stop for just a second. I had two presentations, and we went through uh, the, a different one. Um, so 
Unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring up the other one. There's a lot of similarities, um, but we're missing some of, the, some of the important slides that I wanted to show you. So give me about 30 seconds. Lou Center, do you have any questions at this point? Um, well, first question is what chapter that one of the students asked, what chapter does this? Um, conversation correlate to? I believe it's 10, chapter 10. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, folks, you guys have a question? No. Well, I was going to tell them, um, you guys, your, uh, the number of position papers has been changed to one. Okay? It's been changed from one to two pages to three to four pages. Um, the photography uh, is due uh, May the 20th, and the paper will be due seven days later on the 27th, on Monday the 27th, okay? Uh, so, uh, he was he's just considering time and the effort uh, required to go into two. You're just going to spend more time elaborating on one. So pick a topic that you can, you can work through. I'm almost done with my paper. I'm still kind of working away on it. And, um, and, uh, so you can actually go online and see how I'm doing that. Yeah. So it's not due the third, due the twenty seventh. Due the twenty seventh. Yeah. I, I also, we, I fixed, I amended the document I shared with you yesterday to show that, so you can go back to it. Okay. And thanks. Uh, two people gave me some input. It was Simone and somebody. Hey guys, I, I've got uh, the the other presentation, which is it's, there's some similarities to it. The, the one I just gave you was kind of an intro to renewable energy. Uh, but this one has kind of salted in there some uh, some pretty interesting information and and some uh, and some additional uh, slides. So uh, we kind of have a good in, uh, overview as we looked at all the different energy sources, and now we're going to look at where we are today. So uh, first thing that we want to think about is the difference between energy and electricity. Um, a lot of times you'll hear that solar is blank percent of our whatever use, and then you'll hear a very, very different number from someone else, and you'll say, well, are they lying to me? Well, if they're talking about energy, energy is a really big number, and electricity is a, is a part of energy. So electricity is about maybe 40% of energy, and energy includes not just electricity, but transportation, heating, industrial uses, and so it's, a, it's, it's kind of like the big pie graph of which electricity is a, is a smaller um, part of it. Especially if you guys are writing position papers, you may see that kind of things and focus in on whether they're talking about energy or electricity, okay? Um, this is an amazing slide. Uh, it's mind-blowing. What they did is they took all the different sources of energy that we just talked about, and they, they followed the pathway as to their uses. And so what you'll notice is electricity generation is about 39, uh, is this thing, ooh, it does do it. Uh, right here, about 39.2% of our energy goes to make electricity. So electricity generation is really important, right? It's a big source of, of energy use. Another one is right here where it shows 27% of our energy is used for transportation. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that petroleum is the source for most of the transportation, and then there's just a little bit from biomass. Does anyone know what that biomass that's used for transportation would be? Ethanol. Ethanol. So right here is just showing that ethanol is part of the transportation uh, energy that's used. And then look at that right there, just a little tiny bit. And that's from electricity, believe it or not. Um, and that is, this is from 2011. I hope they come up with a new slide just like this one for 2017, but that was the best one I can find. This number right here will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right now it's nothing, right? But in time, as we electrify the transportation network, this will all change. 
Uh, maybe this will still be a high percentage, like 27%, but maybe instead of getting it all from petroleum, we'll be getting it from electrical generation. And then if these grow and feed into electrical generation, it'll really change things as far as pollution and renewable uh, energy benefits that we get from, uh, from going that route. So one of the things you might be wondering about is with all this stuff going on, I'm here in California, is, is great about things. Where do we stand? Well, you can feel really good. For total energy, that includes heating, it includes transportation, et cetera. Whoop. California is 49th. Now, this is a list that you want to be dead last on because it's showing how much energy that we are using per person in California. And we're basically using 197 uh, million BTUs per person. So per person sort of corrects for the fact that we have 40 million people that live in the state. Uh, when you look up here, our, our biggest energy consumers per person are, is like Louisiana, Wyoming, Alaska, North Dakota. Now, why would they use a lot of energy? Coal, maybe? They're cold weather? I, well, Louisiana's not cold, but they also process a lot of energy. Uh, there you know, a lot of refineries, uh, a lot of mining, those kind of things. But even once you drop off, uh, what you'll find is like Iowa uh, and, and all the rest. I, I didn't put the whole list. Obviously, it jumps from 5 to 46. But what you'll find is that uh, California uses a lot less energy than anyone else. And this, again, includes cars. And you know, the big hit on California is what? We drive everywhere, right? But even with that, uh, we're using less energy than almost every other state. And why is that? Why does California use less energy than other states? Probably because we have the money to have everything kind of like up to date, like latest technology and, and energy efficient. Products. Yeah, we, we spend a lot more money on uh, refrigerators that are, are high efficiency refrigerators or uh, AC units that are, are really efficient. Our cars, we, we are 50% of the electric car market. Our miles per gallon are way higher than anybody else's. Yeah? I was thinking maybe that we, we have laws, that, um, like environmental laws, that like um, sweeten cars need smog checks. We have like a lot of regulations when it comes to environment. Very true. We, we do have uh, laws. One of the laws is building codes. Our insulation and heating efficiency of our, and cooling efficiency of our, our units and stuff, highest in the country. So even though we live in a, in a mild climate compared to, say, Wisconsin, we have the strictest building codes when it comes to energy efficiency in the country. And so it pays off. Um, check this one out. When it comes to electrical use, just electricity, not, um, not transportation and everything else, uh, California is dead last. We use the least amount of electricity per person in the country. And again, Wyoming, Kentucky, uh, District of Columbia, North Dakota, Louisiana, look at the difference. Louisiana uses basically three times more than we do. Wyoming, four times. And if you look at the entire United States, the average is 12,000 versus our 6,700. So that means that we use about half the electricity that um, the rest of the country does. So again, California, feel good about yourselves. Um, they're always knocking us down for all of our, our environmental laws, but when you think about it, what does it save you if you're using less energy? It saves you money, doesn't it? So in other words, you could pay it up front by buying a refrigerator that's more expensive, but after a few years, you're, you're saving money on the electricity side of things, and it actually is a good investment. And so I feel like California invests more in energy efficiency, and other people would say we waste more. But um, I think these figures say that the investment's paying off. It's not a waste. Another thing that you might run into when you guys are doing your papers is capacity versus production. OK, so capacity means how much can this power plant make if it's running full out? So if I'm a coal plant, am I going to run full out pretty much all the time? Yeah. You know what I mean? In other words, you just keep throwing coal in there and it's going to keep cranking out electricity. What about if I'm a solar plant and I'm using photovoltaics? Am I going to be going 
24 hours a day making electricity? No, I'm only going to be able to make electricity when the sun's out. And so as a result, um, capacity is going to overstate what the renewable energy can do. Because typically, like wind, uh, even tidal, all those things are going to be intermittent. Because does the wind always blow? Does the sun always shine? Um, even the tides, they go in and they go out. But there's also times when they're just kind of sitting there. So a lot of times, renewable energy is intermittent. And so that's one of the things to realize, and it's definitely a, a challenge, is what do you do when um, that source of renewable energy isn't there for you because of the weather or because of the situation? Um, another thing uh, that hits on production is um, how much it actually produces. So what things would cause it to not produce 24 hours a day? Stuff like maintenance. Now, solar <laughs> Stuff has very little maintenance, especially photovoltaic. Uh, wind is pretty maintenance free. Uh, you know, every once in a while they have to do some maintenance to it. But a lot of times, like coal plants and, and natural gas plants, they actually require a decent amount of maintenance. Uh, another problem is low demand. So we don't use the same amount of electricity throughout the day. When do you think is the time we use the most electricity? During the late afternoon in the summertime, believe it or not, that's our peak usage. Um, during the winter, uh, probably it tends to be during the day because we're all at the office and whatever, um, and we're using computers and, and, and those kind of things. Um, so how can we drive up production? One of the things we can do is have tracking systems. So a lot of times solar will actually track the sun. Or like we were talking about with the tidal where it was facing one direction when the tide was going this way and another direction when it was going that way. Um, offshore wind is awesome because there's a lot more wind at the ocean uh, than there is inland. Um, and it's more, you know, often that you have it. Um, so we kind of talked about this. This is a slide that you guys already saw. These are the different types of energies that are out there. And these ones all come from the sun either directly or indirectly. And these were the ones that didn't come from the sun. And we looked at what was sustainable. Um, and what wasn't, but knowing that even the ones that are sustainable have to be done correctly in a way that doesn't harm the environment. And we talked about photovoltaic. Uh, this slide here shows how much um, we have built in photovoltaic. So if you look, what do you see right here? What do you see right, what's going on right here? So the years on that is around, right here, around 2010. What's happening with solar? It's exploding. You can't just say it was growing, because growing would mean it grew a little tiny bit, right? It's exploding. And the reason why this happened was because of economics. The price of, of the panels dropped, the price of the inverters dropped, and like I told you guys, it dropped a lot, like 65%. Um, and so as a result, uh, like last year, we installed about 14, 1,800 megawatts of solar, and that's against a total of 42 that's installed. So basically a third of all solar that we have was installed last year. And that's kind of plays out by this graph, you know, when, when, it, when it's showing that. Uh, we have a million people, million residences that, in the United States that have solar. So pretty cool stuff, and uh, we're going to see this growing over and over. What time does this class end? 10.20. Okay. Okay. Um, so here's some good news. Remember I was talking about coal? And I said it hit about 40%. So in 2014, these are real numbers. I pulled them off the EIA myself. I made that graph myself. 39%. Um, and if you look at wind and solar, look at those really low numbers, right? Well, now look at it. 2016, check out coal, 30.4%, meaning that, the, the, that coal has really dropped. But what is taking coal's place? Natural gas, 6.8% in, 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 you know, increase. And then also wind and solar. So these three things. So politics-wise, if you were paying attention to the elections, what is put out as the culprit as to why coal is in, de in, in decline. 
Is it because of natural gas? Is it, if you ask Donald Trump or you watch, ask anybody in Kentucky or West Virginia, what would they tell you was why? They closed the mine, and why did they do that, according to them? Politics, renewable energy, tree hugging, all this other stuff. But natural gas is the one was the big winner. And why is natural gas the big winner? It's easier to get. It's really cheap. Uh, when they're doing all the fracking, which is really jacking up our oil production, they're also getting a bunch of natural gas. And so it's really cheap right now. And so if you're a, a utility, you're going to want to get natural gas because it's cheap. Um, now, is there some politics in there? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to move away from coal. There's no doubt about it. But I just wanted to kind of show you. Now, when you look at wind jumping by 1.1%, you go, wow, that's not very much. But remember, that's about a 20% increase in just a couple of years. And solar going from 0.4% to 1%, that's almost, that's double and a half. That's 250% increase in only two years. So, um, What's going to happen is these guys are going to really, really grow over the next few years um, and become more and more a part of the mix. And these other areas are going to shrink. We should buy stock while we can. You should. Uh, investing in green energy right now is pretty smart. It's a good move. So California, um, again, number one state. Um, and what you'll find is about 13% of our electricity was made from solar which is the highest amount in the country. And I was telling you guys earlier, there's 100,000 people that are working in uh, solar right now. And this graph here just shows you how many, uh, you know, what, what the installation rate has been. Um, and then they actually project out for the next few years. So you can see 2016 was a big year. Um, Again, going back to just kind of throwing you some numbers, um, how much money we've spent. Uh, we spent just under $50 billion so far on uh, solar in our state. And this is a cool number here, 64% price decline in the last five years. Like I said, something that cost 10,000 bucks now costs 35 or 3,600 bucks, pretty cool. And the projection is we're going to grow another 14.2 gigawatts over the next five years, which is the most in the United States. Uh, so again, solar is, a, is big in California. Solar thermal, um, at first glance, looks like a dumb way to do things. It's really complicated. There's a lot of parts to it, maintenance and everything else. But what is really cool about solar thermal? Right here, it can be stored. What's the problem with photovoltaic? It's instant light to electricity. It, it, you know, you make it right now because the sun hit me. I made electricity. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And so we're running into a situation sometimes where we have so much solar that we have to send it to other states. And they actually charge us to take the electricity. They charge us to take the electricity. So pretty cool for them, right? Um, and so that becomes an issue. So one of the things is solar thermal, the, the economics might at first not look that great, but because you're heating a fluid, you could store that fluid. And what you could do is instead of producing maximum at noon, when all the PV photovoltaic is making maximum, you can make your maximum at 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night and make a crazy amount of electricity. What did we say were the biggest times of the day when we want to use electricity? the late afternoon, 5, 6, 7, 8 o'clock at night. So solar thermal, uh, because of the storage, is, is pretty slick. Uh, and it's a good technology. There's different technologies. The older one is what's called line focus. And what they would do is they would have a curved mirror, and they would have a, a, a pipe that runs through it. And the curved mirror is set and always has to track the sun, right? And it focuses all the light onto that, that pipe. And that pipe gets super hot. How hot? About 500 degrees. Pretty hot, right? And then they just use that working fluid to do the whole steam turbine thing, right? Now they have another technology out there called point focus. And if you've been driving out to um, Las Vegas and you get to the border, there's a, there's a plant called Ivanpah. And Ivanpah is a tower. And it has all these mirrors shining up at it. And so what they do is 
you get that, uh, that working fluid up to 1,000 degrees. And so it's more efficient. Um, they had problems for a while when a bird would fly right about there, it would become uh, a cooked bird. But I think the birds are figuring out, don't fly there. <laughs> All right? They just are like, hey, you know, Charlie flew there and didn't go well. Um, so, um, again, the line fo focus so solar thermal, kind of what I told you, this just shows you a system of, this is all the hot water coming off of the uh, mirrors. It goes in, makes the uh, electricity here, and then uh, it can be stored. And then it circulates out, and it just keeps going around in a circle. That becomes an issue. Why is water an issue as well? It evaporates, and we got to be careful because if we're in a desert environment, what's very valuable? Water. So we don't want to have a system that uses a lot of water. So that becomes an issue as well. Remember we talked about sustainable, right? We don't want to have a system that, hey, we're using sunlight, and we're depleting the water table, and we're doing all this other stuff um, that's all negative. We want it to, to be as positive as possible and have very few negative aspects to it. Um, so again, there's a, there's a plant out there in, uh, in Nevada, and it's a line-focused plant. We actually have one, an older one, on th uh, 395 and, uh, what is that, fi uh, 57, uh, four corners. Um, and, and so th these things are out there, and so that's what it would look like. Um, again, their fluid, uh, the, a newer version, about 735 degrees. And remember, the, the higher we can get this temperature, the more efficient the uh, plant's going to be. Uh, Ivan Paul, we sort of talked about. Uh, what's cool about Ivanpah is they use uh, their condensers use air instead of water to cool them off. So they must have big fans and blow through there. And um, as a result, uh, it doesn't use a whole lot of water. The only thing they do have to do is they have to um, clean the mirrors. You know, they got to clean them, you know, all the time. And as a result, they do use some water, but supposedly less than a golf course. Crescent Dunes. Here's another one. This is another tower one. This looks like something out of Lord of the Rings, you know, maybe this is, uh, but uh, again, uh, this one gets, uh, uh, molt this is that molten salt we were talking about earlier, and it gets up to, um, again, about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, really hot, and what's cool about this is it can store that uh, molten salt for about 10 hours, so that means that the whole problem of uh, the sun going down and not being able to make electricity, it's, it's gone. Um, the only bad thing is, is look at the price here. 10 to 12 cents per kilowatt water uh, hour versus about 3 to 6 for uh, PV. So much more expensive. But what happens when we make more of these? The cost, because you go, hey, well, you're going to make the same thing, so we're going to tweak it just a tiny bit, and that's it. And so if we build a bunch of these... Um, the price will come down. Now, here's another question. What would Neville not like about this? There, there's a huge footprint there, right? There was something that was there. There was an ecosystem was there. And then we went in there, and we tore it all up, and we put these mirrors in there. And so that's always going to be an issue with solar, because it usually takes up a decent amount of space. And you want to do it um, you know, with the environment in mind. So making sure we understand solar thermal is going to use heat, uh, light to turn to heat, and then we're going to use that heat to heat water or oil or molten so uh, salts, and then we're going to turn a turbine and make electricity. And what's really cool is storage. Photovoltaic, pretty simple stuff. Light turns to electricity, and, and we convert that to AC, and then uh, we use it. But it's only used for, uh, it only makes electricity when the sun is shining on it. Storage is an add-on, and that's what we need to be doing. If we can add that on as part of the plan, in other words, you're going to build this 400 megawatt plant, great. But you're also going to throw 100 megawatts uh, worth of uh, storage on there. Uh, that's what we need to evolve to, and that's kind of where we're going right now. Um, Puerto Rico right now is looking at that because they had that, those hurricanes. Uh, there was a, um, a hospital, had a 645 kilowatt system. 
it used a ballast system where instead of like drilling into the building with, with lag screws or something, really making it rigid, it was basically almost like a weeble wobble. It went in and it was in a, it just had some rocks that kind of held it on the roof, just weighted down. Well, when the hurricane came in, it blew and it just kind of went like this. And then the hurricane stopped and it's like, okay, I'm ready to make electricity again. So it withstood a Cat 4 and a Cat 5 uh, hurricane and is, is producing electricity. So that kind of points the way of what's possible. So uh, perhaps th that they'll go that route, and that's photovoltaic. And then if you throw some batteries in there, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. The batteries are expensive. So solar resources. Um, right here, this dark brown, that's the best part of the United States for solar. And you can see that we live right here, and that's why we see so much solar. Um, really, anywhere in here where it's kind of this orangey is probably pretty good. This yellowy stuff, not good. So Seattle, never going to be a solar powerhouse. Uh, neither will, like, Wisconsin, Mi Michigan, Ohio, and stuff. They just don't get the sunlight that, that they need. They have a lot of cloudy days. So that's one thing to keep in mind when it comes to renewable energy. There's not one answer for every... Um, everybody, there's a whole bunch of answers. And you got to take the answer that works best for you. Uh, oh, I almost forgot about little Hawaii. Hawaii gets a lot of sun, and they're actually uh, big time moving towards um, solar. Wind. Uh, we already kind of know wind spins a turbine, right? Spins the shaft, makes the generator. Um, and we get that wild AC, and we got to convert it into usable AC. When wind comes from the flows of different pressure things. So these are just a map of the, the major wind patterns that we have on the planet. And so not everyone has the same amount of winds. Um, if you have a lot of mountains and valleys, you're going to tend to have winds in those areas, intense winds. Um, bodies of water cause wind because of the, uh, the changes in temperature. Um, the power of the wind or the, the amount that you can pull off, it has a lot to do with how fast the wind is blowing. So what's crazy is um, the formula there, you see that V, that's velocity, and it, you square it. So check this out. An 8 meter per second wind has twice the energy of a, a, uh, a 6 meter per second uh, squared, excuse me, 6 meters per second wind velocity. So in other words, Say the wind's blowing five miles an hour, it makes a certain amount. If it, grow, if it blows like, say, seven miles per hour, it's going to make twice as much energy. And so if we can get it up to like 30, 40 miles an hour, that's, that's the hot ticket. So here's a map of the United States. Now we looked at solar and we know this is the good area for solar, right? But what is this? This is the good area for wind. Because they have a lot of wind and um, this is on average... One of the things that on these maps, it'll say at, at what height, because it's 30 meters, so that's about 90, 100 feet up in the air. That's what they're measuring. The higher you go, the more wind there is, right? So check this out. If we put our turbines and we put them way up there, and so this one shows, what, 80 meters? So that's about 250 feet. Is that high? Pretty dang high, but you ought to see some of these turbines that are coming out. They're <laughs> unbelievable. You'll see that it gets really intense in this area. And so what we're seeing right now is this area of the country has gone crazy with wind. Just like we have gone crazy with solar, these guys have gone crazy with wind. And then if we look offshore, right, this is all good stuff. And so now wind becomes something that we can use in a lot of different places, right? Even though I love solar, it's my favorite, um, I can see that, that wind is going to be the hot... Uh, Ticket. Now, right here, Rhode Island is putting together a system right now. And so that'll be our first offshore in the United States. Scotland has already done it. I think Scotland the other day said they were 100% renewable now. Uh, they don't use, uh, all their electricity is renewable, and it's all created from, um, from wind. So pretty cool stuff. So these wind farms, they're huge. Like I say, we start looking at these numbers. The, the, the rotation diameter is 164 meters. So multiply that by three, and you're talking 500 and some feet. So that's bigger than a football field. Two football fields spinning in the air. Crazy. Um, but the bigger they get, the, the more electricity they make. 
So they have one, this one here, it's called a Vesta V164. Uh, it makes eight megawatts, eight megawatts. They had, a, they had a thing where if it rotates one time, it could drive a car for uh, 40 miles for every rotation. It's just mind boggling the amount of electricity it makes. Um, again, going back to California, what are we doing with wind? The wind is the red, and so you see it, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. We're kind of doing wind. You see the big thing is with the solar, because that little yellow thing is solar. Um, again, uh, here's California. 27% of our electricity was made from renewables. Um, a lot of that is from um, hydro and from, and from uh, solar. And our wind is, is a decent amount, too. And again, if you look over time, it was pretty flat. You know, we weren't really growing. And then around 2011, 2012, when the solar really took off, you're starting to see renewables um, become a really big part of our mix in California. And if you look right there, that's solar. And again, the red is, is wind, and you're seeing it grow. But you'll notice that hydro is not growing. Why isn't hydro growing? Why, why, why aren't we doing more hydro? Could be because of the drought. And you'll find that when we do have a drought, the amount of hydro drops that we do. Uh, what's another thing? Why isn't it growing? Because there's only so many sources. We've dammed it all up, man. There's nothing left to dam, right? So, you know, you can't grow unless you just, hey, there's this big river we never knew about. Um, but, but there isn't, and so we, we can't. We've, we've maxed it out. Uh, again, this is what, these are all the wind plants in the United States. This is a really cool uh, graph. It shows you by state how much each state makes with wind. And you'll notice Texas, 20,000 megawatts. That's crazy. Or it should be megawatt hours. Or no, that's capacity. Um, California, 5,600. So about a fourth of what Texas does. And right in here, there's Iowa. So we are the third. Iowa's the second as far as capacity. But check this out. Look at the percentage of electricity made by wind, by state. So in California, it was 6.9%. Pretty decent. But check out Texas. 12.6, that's a lot. And as you go through these other states, you'll see some really big numbers. Iowa, 36% of their electricity comes from wind. 36%, that's just crazy. Uh, Kansas, 29%, Oklahoma, 25%. How many people knew that? Are you surprised? Because sometimes you hear these red states that are against renewables, right? Well. They're against solar because solar isn't that great for them. But they're not against wind, are they? Because wind's doing awesome stuff. And what they're doing is they're taking a farm like that grows wheat and whatnot, and they just put these big old uh, wind turbines in there. And so not only are they farming, but they're also getting paid to lease the land to the utility company. So it's working out pretty good for them. Now, what area of the country is not doing renewables? This group right here. And why not? Because of the Bible Belt. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I could slam on the south. It wouldn't be the first time. But um, a big reason is they don't have the wind resource. And the sun resource is there, but it's not as compelling as, as us. And as the prices drop, the south will go solar. Um, the wind just really isn't there for them. Um, but there's some other reasons, too, that we'll get to. Um, so wind is growing rapidly, it's cheap, it's worldwide, um, and the potential is enormous. It will be the number one renewable energy. I'm, sh I'm sure it will overtake um, uh, hydro very, very soon. And then solar will be the number three for a long time, and then it'll become the number two. So uh, again, this is California. I think a lot of this we've seen before, so I'm going to kind of go through it quickly. Um, hydro, we've, we saw this earlier, how it's created. Again, it's kind of maxed out. We've, we've tended to dam up everything we could. Um, bioenergy, we sort of saw this slide earlier, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through it. Coal, oil, gasoline, natural gas. These are the ones that we saw already earlier. All right. So uh, why do we want to transition to renewables? Well, climate change. What happens is I think in the last 15 years, we've had 14 of the hottest years ever in 15. Is that a coincidence? 
I don't think so. Um, and so what's happening is, is, is carbon dioxide just absorbs more heat. It keeps more heat on the Earth instead of going out into outer space. And the more energy that's in a system, the more violent things get. The more evaporation happens, the more intense your hurricane, the more intense your drought. And so it's happening. Pollution. I told you guys earlier, you can't believe what things were like. It's so cool to see California get cleaner air. A big thing of, of mine is war. I was in the Navy for seven years. And I was there after the first Gulf War, but before the, the second Gulf War. And so I kind of missed out on the hardships. But uh, we send people there. We spend crazy amounts of money. Uh, and they come back, you know, injured mentally, physically, emotionally. And, we're, and, and why? Why do we fight in, you know, in the, the Middle East, but we don't fight in Africa? We don't fight in Latin America because they have oil. And that's just how it is. Um, and so if we can get away from oil and, ga and, and, and diesel and that kind of stuff and get to electricity and we're making our own electricity and everybody's making their own energy in the world, we're not going to fight about that. I'm sure we can come up with some other things to fight about, but at least we won't have to fight about that anymore. Uh, a big thing is transforming societies out of poverty. Um, when you have electricity and you can read at night, when you can have economic activity at night because it's not pitch black dark, it grows your economy. It allows people to educate because maybe they work during the day, but at night they can read books. Now, you guys, we, we take electricity for granted, but there are lots and lots and lots of places where when the sun sets, they just kind of sit around in the dark and maybe they, they have a kerosene, you know, something, but not much, and they all go to bed early. Um, and what we want to do is we want to transform those societies. And that, as that happens, it stabilizes the human population instead of people being bored. And what are we going to do? Well, let's make some kids. We kind of chill out, have one or two, right? And uh, it stabilizes things. And it's happening right now. You look at the, the it's happening. Good things are happening. Um, so as we move away from this, and we started to impact it with renewables, it's going to have a huge impact on our world. And again, looking at the United States, this is solar country. This is wind country. This is offshore country, right? There's all these different ways of addressing uh, our problems. And what's going to happen is if we put the right government policies in place, it's going to help. So when we have goals, when a state says we want to become renewable, they become renewable. You can see it right here, right? When they don't have goals, like these guys, they don't get renewable. And so um, it's really important that we realize how our own policies in California have benefited us. We spend more, but we invest more, and we save more. And we have a better world for it. Again, this area. They're not setting the goals, and they're not reaching the goals. Um, rural electricity demand or trends, renewables are up, and non-renewables are going to go down. And there's places like uh, uh, Costa Rica, pretty much 100% renewable. Goal, those goals are being set all over the world. Uh, we are right now, in a, we're kind of being left behind a little bit, but a lot of states are just moving forward and not worrying about the feds. Um, we are going to get there. Uh, renewable energy will hit about 9% this year, uh, which is awesome. And this is not hydro, non-hydro. And what's happening in the rest of the world? A lot of them are they're just skipping the whole coal plant stage. They're going right to solar because it's easy. You set it up, and now you have your electricity, and you run what you need to run. And this is good stuff. Because in the end, do you want to live in this city? Or do you want to live in that city? Right? That's China. They did the whole coal thing, right? So this is the world we want, right? And it's just going to take time, effort, education, voting. Um, and uh, it can be done. We have the technology for it. So, all right, guys. Uh, that's the show. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I can answer them. <laughs>